All that evening, the Germans had been in a kind of hysterical condition. The few remaining cows in the village were slaughtered and eaten with a sort of cannibal frenzy. When a barrel of pickled cabbage was discovered in one hut, it led to wild scrambles. Altogether, they had been very short of food ever since the encirclement. With the German army in constant retreat, they didn't have large stores anywhere near the front line. So these troops at Corson had been living mostly by looting the local population. They had done so even before the encirclement. They had also had a lot to drink that night, but the fire started by the U-2s and then the bombing and the shelling sobered them up. Driven out of their warm huts, they had to abandon Shandarovka. They flocked into the ravines near the village and then took the desperate decision to break through early in the morning. They had almost no tanks left. They had all been lost and abandoned during the previous day's fighting. And what few tanks they still had now had no petrol. In the last few days, the area where they were concentrated was so small that transport planes could no longer bring them anything. Even before, few of the transport planes reached them and sometimes the cargoes and food and petrol and munitions were dropped on our lines. So that morning they formed themselves into two marching columns of about 14,000 each and they marched in this way to Lysianka, where the two ravines met. Lysianka was beyond our front line, inside the corridor. The German divisions on the other side were trying to batter their way eastward, but now the corridor was so wide that they hadn't much chance. They were a strange sight, these two German columns that tried to break out of the encirclement. Each of them was like an enormous mob. The spearhead and the flanks were formed by the SS men of the Wallonia Brigade and the Viking division in their pearl grey uniforms. They were in a relatively good state of physique. Then, inside the triangle, marched the rabble of the ordinary German infantry, very much more down at heel. Right in the middle of this, a small select nucleus was formed by the officers. They also looked relatively well fed. So they moved westward along two parallel ravines. They had started out after 4 a.m., while it was still completely dark. We knew the direction from which they were coming. We had prepared five lines. Two lines of infantry, then a line of artillery, and then two more lines where the tanks and cavalry lay in wait. We let them pass through the first three lines without firing a shot. The Germans, believing that they had dodged us and had now broken through all our defenses, burst into frantic, jubilant screaming, firing their pistols and tommy guns into the air as they marched on. They had now emerged from the ravines and reached open country. Then it happened. It was about six o'clock in the morning. Our tanks and our cavalry suddenly appeared and rushed straight into the thick of the two columns. What happened then is hard to describe. The Germans ran in all directions, and for the next four hours our tanks raced up and down the plain, crushing them by the hundred. Our cavalry, competing with the tanks, chased them through the ravines, where it was hard for the tanks to pursue them. Most of the time the tanks were not using their guns, lest they hit their own cavalry. Hundreds and hundreds of cavalry were hacking at them with their sabers, and massacred the Fritzes, as no one had ever been massacred by cavalry before. There was no time to take prisoners. It was a kind of carnage that nothing could stop until it was all over. In a small area, over 20,000 Germans were killed. I had been in Stalingrad, but never had I seen such concentrated slaughter as in the fields and ravines of that small bit of country. By 9 a.m., it was all over. 8,000 prisoners surrendered that day. Nearly all of them had run a long distance away from the main scene of the slaughter. They had been hiding in the woods and ravines.